Namaste. Welcome to the beginning of another live Sangha. You may notice that today will be a little different just because I've structured it according to an ancient idea of Sanghas taking place in thirds, which the first third is now happening. That is Shravana, meaning hearing it's dedicated to receiving new information, like, uh, well, like introducing ourselves, like uh, a show and tell, which we'll do, and reading from a text. The second third will be dedicated to manana, which is like questions and answers, contemplation and interactive exploration of concepts. And then the final third will be dedicated to nididhasana, which is a supplementary practice to really lock in what we've experienced today. And that takes the form of a meditation or a guided contemplation of some sort. Actually, we've already kind of been doing that, so the Sangha doesn't really change for you other than just the order through which we go th through the thing, so welcome. I still would like to begin with an invocation to the Gayatri Mantra, so um, if you know it, you're welcome to join along with me. Swaha tatsa vitor varenyam Bhargo devasya dhi mahi dhiyo yona prachodayat. Om. As we await our first guests to continue to arrive, allow me to set the intention for this space as being a welcoming environment open to everyone, regardless of background, identity, orientation, ethnicity. This place is uh, one for all traditions, and I hope you feel included. May we come together as fellow students of life to uplift each other, relate in one another's experiences, and share positive sentiments. Om. Namaste, dear Sky Guardian. With our change of uh, breaking up our live stream into thirds, does that mean only reading once? Yes. However, that also means we'll have more time to read at the start. So, just the order through which we do things will change. Nothing else, really. Radhi, Radhi, dear Magdalene. Namaste. Modibit. If I can pronounce her name better, please let me know. Welcome, yeah. Happy Yom Kippur. Oh, I didn't even know it was Yom Kippur today. What a what an important holiday for Judaism. Namaste, dear Mina. What an interesting question you've asked. Let's put a pin in that and explore that once we get to the Manana section of our live stream. And thank you, dear Kay's Nest. Welcome. Welcome, dear Sarah. You share that you are stressed and anxious from work. That's quite all right. And I'm grateful that, well, that you are grateful for the space. We share the gratitude for the space. That's wonderful. Mm. Thank you, dear Sky Guardian. Um, to quickly answer your question, although we'll explore it in more detail later, Mina, uh, the answer is no. That uh, according to reincarnation, if we decide to not live right now, it would not just be a simple restart button because many things would change. For one, uh, we would gain the karmas of hurting the people around us in our life. It appears to be an easy way out, but it only delays the lessons we have to learn and passes on a lot of our suffering to those around us. And there's very little room for that, unless, of course, you are struggling with a chronic or a terminal illness, then it's understandable. But namaste, dear Kalkiji. 
Namaste, Dale. Hello, dear Asad. Thank you, Kalkiji, for the rose you sent to him. Hari Om Tat Sat. So, uh, welcome everyone. I would like to read a short section from our book, Hollywood to the Himalayas. This is a book about well, an American woman that later became known as Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati. And uh, she came from Hollywood. As the title of the book suggests, and you'll never guess where she's going. To New York. No, just kidding. To Hollywood. No, to Himalayas. <laughs> Which is in... Uh, India, where she is located now. We are in the 17th chapter. She has found a guru, and she is discovering what it even means to have one, since she certainly did not expect to have one. Thank you, dear Kalkiji. All right, let's begin. The 17th chapter is called Obedience and Disobedience. No one ever told me that obedience was expected in the guru-disciple relationship. Respect, of course. Reverence, of course. Devotion, of course. But obedience? And unconditionally, even in the absence of reason? It was early December 1996, and Swamiji, my guru, asked when I'd be going back to America. He asked it casually and straightforwardly, perhaps offering to help me make arrangements to get to Delhi. He's sometimes like a doting mother. Have you had your meal? Was how he began most of our conversations those first months. If I ever said no or not yet, he would end our conversation abruptly, ring the bell by his side and instruct the young man who came running to immediately feed me. Go! Go and eat, then come back. So the question about travel plans seemed innocent and kind. When I'd arrived at the ashram three months earlier, the registration form had asked, expected date of departure, December 15, I had written. I hope that all of you had, uh, had got your eating in to make sure that you are fed. My flight to San Francisco had been scheduled for the evening of the 15th, and graduate school classes were to resume the first week of January. I had filled out that form before everything in my life changed, before I knew that this was where I was meant to be, before I knew that this was home. As many of you remember, our author had departed from her husband because originally her husband went for a spiritual pilgrimage, but she was the one that ended up finding a guru, and he didn't like that and left her. But uh, she was happy to stay. She had found her home. Go back, I thought. Had this whole experience be a Narnian adventure? Was I now required to walk back through the wardrobe, leaving behind a world of love, beauty, vibrancy, and truth? I wouldn't. I had eaten no forbidden apples. I had disobeyed no divine instruction. Was I being kicked out of the Garden of Eden? Go back. I couldn't think any other thought. With each repetition of the question, I sank from the heights of joy to shock, anger, rebellion, and terror. Was he kicking me out? I hadn't done anything wrong. I don't want to leave, I whispered. My voice had left with my joy. Not only the rug, but also the floor and the very foundation had been pulled out from beneath me, and it carried my breath along too. I want to stay. I gasped, and I wondered whether the floor I was sitting on was sturdy enough to support me as I crumbled. Swamiji appeared, surprised by my reaction, and looked at me across the low wooden table. Had he not realized this was forever? <laughs> Could he really think I would leave? I thought we'd agreed that it was God's plan for me to be there, and to me that meant forever. 
I don't know which was harder to accept, returning to California or that Swamiji didn't realize I was meant to stay. He tried the cultural argument. You will not be comfortable here forever. You will miss so many things. Ashram life is not easy. You are used to comfort. You have loved this for a few months, but forever is different. I could not believe it. Couldn't he see deeply into my soul and know I had already been given more than I'd ever imagined possible? Like a mother explaining to her child at the dinner table, lovingly but pointedly, Yes, honey, you can have ice cream for dessert, but only after you finish your spinach. Swamiji said, But you have to go back. You have to finish your psychology PhD degree. My what? A piece of paper that indicates I've successfully learned to identify pathologies and put people in boxes? A degree that required me to believe only what could be supported by research already completed, that offered a rope of innovation that was only as long as the list of supporting documents? A degree to heal traumatized children that seemed mostly, mostly to bolster my own ego? My voice shook as I explained. Swamiji, I don't want to finish my degree. It's unnecessary. I entered this PhD program to help children, but here I am, with only my research and dissertation left, and I have not helped one child. The only thing being helped is my own ego. I get A's on exams, and my ego likes it. A teacher pats me on the back for a smart comment in class, and I like it. I get the highest IQ scores, and I like it. But it's just ego. It's not benefiting children or the world. Tens of thousands of people get PhDs every year, and the world is not a better place, I continued. There is no connection between a PhD and alleviating misery, despair, and trauma in the world. You live every minute of your life making the world a better place. Through some crazy, amazing gift of grace, God has given me an opportunity to be part of something that actually makes the world a better place. How can I leave this to go back for a piece of paper? I was pleading. He ignored my arguments and simply said, You must go back and finish your degree. Then, if you still want to come back, you can come back. He smiled at me as though this were a good and practical thing to do. I should be happy. He was giving good, practical advice. Although I was sitting on the ground, my legs seemed to give way beneath me. I couldn't breathe. Should I beg? Cry? I'm the daughter of a great lawyer. I had won every debate in school. I would not be victim to such a ridiculous fate without an argument. Swamiji, I said, keeping my voice as stable and firm, yet polite as I could. Yes. May I ask you something? Of course. I want to understand. Please correct me anywhere I say something that is not true. He smiled. You say God is omniscient, right? That he knows everything. Swamiji nodded. Of course God knows everything. And you say he's omnipotent, right? He is all-powerful and can do anything, correct? Again, Swamiji nodded. These were such basic questions. Where was I going with this? You say he is good, right? He is all-loving and all-compassionate. He wants only the best for all of us. Mm hmm? Swamiji replied with a smile at his disciple, the Advocate. So, I, able protege of law and orders, Jack McCoy, concluded, If God is omniscient, it means that he knew I was going to have this experience when I came here. He knew I still had two years left in my PhD program to finish my research and dissertation. If he is omnipotent, he could have made me not have the experience I did. He also could have made me come here after I'd finished my degree. If he is good then he certainly doesn't want to send me back after having had the experiences I've had simply to suffer in a meaningless program for the next two years. Therefore, 
I could not look at Swamiji. I was on too much of an intellectual high. If I'd make eye contact, it would have broken the spell of how well my mind was working. Therefore, either God is not omniscient and didn't know I'd have this experience, or he is not omnipotent and couldn't have done anything about it, or he is not good and therefore wants me to suffer, or... I paused for effect. Or it means I am meant to stay here. <laughs> Silence. I took a breath. There it was, the truth as I understood it. Irrefutable, in my opinion. I half expected a gavel to appear and bang itself on the small wooden table in front of Swamiji. Objection sustained, the court would say. I could stay. But no magical gavel appeared and no universal judge spoke. There was silence. Okay, Swamiji said. Let's do one thing. He did not respond to all to what I had said. Or, he did not respond at all to what I had said. He did not try to argue or explain or justify his instructions. My intellectual advocacy exercise existed in one plane, and his knowledge of what needed to happen was on a different plane. Go back and finish just the next semester, the one you are already res registered for, the one your parents have already paid for. Get your straight A's, and then, if you still feel it's right, go through the proper channel to leave, and then you can come back. It won't look nice to just call and cancel your return now. It won't look nice is one of those Indian expressions that used to ex exasperate me. To whom, I would ask. Who's looking? But as time went on and I learned Hindi, I understood the phrase from which it's literally translated. Tik nahi lakda hai. Really it means it's not right, or it doesn't appear to be correct. One semester sounded like a fair compromise, although far from ideal. Why, I whined, as I hadn't since childhood. Why do I have to go back? Why do I have to finish the semester? There. There's a, there's a hair in my tongue somewhere. <laughs> mean that you like that phrase. <laughs> I was sure of the illegitimacy of his instruction, as kids are when their parents explain about waiting till after dinner for dessert. But why? Why can't I have my ice cream first? When something is so perfect, how can there possibly be a good reason to delay? Swamiji looked at me leaned back in his chair and resigned that I was not going to just obey and crawl away, began to explain. You see only what you want to see. You see only what is happening to you. You see only what feels good and right to you. I see more. If you do not go back now, people will say you were brainwashed, that you joined a cult, that you ran away. That is not useful. If you are going to stay here, you must stay as a model of someone who has renounced something she had, not something she didn't have. To renounce that which you're failing at is not renunciation. To give up something you are losing anyway is not noble. If you come back here, you will be a model of someone who chose the spiritual path over the material path, he added. To be a model... You have to do what is right. Otherwise, people will just think you went crazy or got brainwashed. You will be of no use. The part of my brain able to be rational understood his meaning. That my life as a renunciant, and even as a teacher, a leader, or inspiring figure, would not bear fruit if people could write me off in those ways. Now nearly 25 years since we had this conversation. I am no less impressed by his vast understanding of worlds he's never inhabited. 
Swamiji never in his lifetime lived in a college dorm. He never went to summer camp. He never attended a slumber party. He never experienced the challenges of married life or the subtleties of social circles and modern societies. Yet, his understanding of emotional triggers, expectations, psychological games and nuances in the dance of relationships is profound. The causes of and solutions to insurmountable and irreconcilable differences in marriage, parenting dilemmas and extended family dramas are clear to him, as though acquired from some universal book of knowledge. He knew, without ever meeting my parents, exactly how they would respond. He knew, without having ever lived in America, how my academic and social community would respond. I, who had known my parents for a quarter of a century, who had grown up in my community, who had spent nearly seven years in the world of Palo Alto's academia, imagined that everyone would understand. I'd never really thought about it. It was just obvious. I would call home and tell them I was staying in India. I had found God and found my Guru. Of course they would understand. I would call my school and tell them I wasn't coming back, that they should refund my parents' tuition money. Whether they understood or not was unimportant to me. I was done. And society... My world of grand, grande soy lattes with three shots of espresso, salad bars and non-dairy frozen yogurt, burritos at the beach and naked Sundays in the spas of San Francisco, memorizing facts to recite back at professors, stressing over exams and then celebrating each A. That world existed in some forgotten dimension. Who cared what they thought? When I was around three years old, I had a whole community of plastic little people made by Fisher Price and I played with them constantly. They had their own houses and schools and parks. I wonder if any of you had those too. One day I flushed them all down the toilet to see if they could swim. <laughs> that they never returned from their swimming adventure did not disturb me. I can still see my mother's face as she came into the toilet as I kept flushing and reflushing. I want to see if the little people can swim, I explained. <laughs> then, with the last flush, they were gone. If they could swim, they were swimming in some other direction. If they couldn't, they had gone to the land of people who can't swim. I did not mourn for my little people, for they weren't gone. They were swimming or not swimming, in a magical land on the other side of the toilet. In their own wonderland, they were no longer with me, but that was fine. They were living in toilet land, and I was living on Hargis Street in Los Angeles. On that December morning in 1996 in Rishikesh, 22 years after I'd flushed the little people down the toilet, my feelings toward everyone, I and I was living, wait, I skipped a sentence. My feelings toward everyone I knew from my other life were similar. Everyone I knew was living in that land and I was living in this land. They were fine, I was fine. Why was Swamiji so concerned about what they thought? As the sun burst through the early morning fog unveiling the fluorescent purple, oh boy, now that's a word I've never seen before. Bougainvillea, Bougain, Bougainvillea, B O U G A I N V I L L E A. If there's a wordsmith in the audience, please tell me the meaning of that word. Anyway, whatever that is, the fluorescent purple that hanging from every rooftop into Swamiji's garden, as I watch the rays of sun rise over the Himalayas, everyone seemed fine. It's a flowering plant. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I always get in trouble with my mom. She's always telling me the names of the plants and flowers, and I'm saying, why do you, why do you need to know their names? Aren't they just nameless? Why do we have to put labels on them? And she would say, because it's fun to know. And you feel more connected once you know how to take care of it and 
what kind of identity it has, etc. I'm still learning. In retrospect, I realized that if I were not living my own spiritual experience, if I could not feel the tears of ecstatic union with every blade of grass, every tree, every drop of Ganga pouring out of my own eyes, if I didn't feel the nearly constant surge of expansion and connection with each breath, I would have said I'd become a sociopath. Let them live in that land. My family, my friends, those who had been the very foundation of my life for 25 years, the nearly instant detachment I felt from that first moment on the banks of the Ganga was something I would understand only many years later. At the time, though, I knew it was rooted in love. Swamiji understood it all. He lived in every land, simultaneously, and just as he knew, simply by looking in my eyes from fifteen feet away, when I needed to be locked into a room, he knew what my parents and community needed without having met them. So as per the original plan, I boarded a flight back to California on the 15th of December. Pollution in India is much worse in winter time than summer, in summer, rain cleans the skies. In winter, it's dry and cold. People living and working on the streets burn whatever they can to stay warm. Piles of flammable trash are ubiquitous in Delhi. So nearly every corner will find homeless people and day laborers huddled over burning mounds of trash, warming their hands in toxic fumes. November and December are also the months when the husks of autumn's crops are burned. With no functional system of composting and no waste management infrastructure, the farmers of Haryana and Uttar Pradesh spent the latter part of November and December burning husks and other unusable parts of rice, corn, millet, and sourgum from their autumn harvest. Sorghum. Maybe that's how that's pronounced. Visibility in Delhi in daytime is worse than in most cities at night. The sun is eclipsed not by the moon, but by a thick, impenetrable layer of smoke. As my flight took off from Delhi for San Francisco, as I watched the city, faintly visible beneath the veil of smog, get smaller and smaller, I cried. Not with ecstasy or truth this time, but with bottomless sadness. The Indian woman in the next seat, next to me, tried to make conversation. Married? she asked. Yes, to Ganga, I told her. Thank you for listening. That is the end of the 17th chapter. So, what did we learn in that part? That she wanted to stay, but her guru said, no, you need to go back. And she didn't understand because she was happy here. Why did it matter? But I suppose such is the nature of very wise, elevated beings. Even though they recognize the peace and the path you have chosen, they also want it to appear as a voluntary one, not just for your own satisfaction, but for those that care and love you. And I think that's really beautiful, that uh, even in the far-off land of the spirituality of India, still, these gurus care about what our communities back home think of us, and society standards are still considered respected, as well as the choice to go beyond them. I truly believe that uh, spirituality is one that doesn't reject any part of life, but finds a way of including it with respect and appreciation and the ultimate free will of everyone involved. I hope to continue reading with this this uh, next time. That was a bit of a, a longer reading session, 
But as I said, and I'll continue saying as we adjust to this new structure, I've made it so that our uh, live streams just have one reading session, one kind of longer reading session at the beginning to um, supplement the idea of Shravana, the acquiring of new experiences. Then as the live stream goes on, we process that and conclude rather than acquiring anything new near the ending too. So welcome to everyone who joined while we were reading as well. And thank you to those who sent a, uh, a gift while we read too. It may take a moment for me to go through these gifts, so thank you for your patience, everyone. Mm -hmm. Amina, you share that we learned we should not try to seem crazy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I always think about that every time I wear a house scout to, to these these sanghas. I just kind of ran out of time, and when I started streaming today, I thought, oh, I didn't change. But I think, you know, I should probably wear more professional clothes so so I don't just get written off as as a as a crazy guy in a in a bathrobe. <laughs> but it's very comfy, I will admit. <laughs> All right. Dear Anna, thank you for the pumpkin that you sent. Hari Om Tat Sat And Hybrid Jen, thank you for your quintet of roses. Om Aing Saraswati Namaha Angela, thank you for your finger heart too. Ram Ram And uh... I do see there are wonderful questions being asked. I'll just mention that uh, the middle third of this live stream, which we're just about to go into, will be dedicated to questions and answers. So if you can wait just uh, a little bit, I'll, I'll happily entertain all questions. Dear, dear Deb, thank you for your rose and pair of baby ghosts and horror candles too. Om Brahm Bhairvaya Namo Namaha Thank you Babofishi for your quintet of roses too. Jaya Sitaram And dear Cody Jane Thank you for your heart me. Hare Krishna And hybrid Jen Thank you for your paper crane and quartet of roses. Om Kring Kalikai Namaha Thank you, dear Anasek, for your pair of finger hearts. Radhe, Radhe And Gabriella, thank you for your heart, me too. Om Namah Shakti Shivai No gift is ever expected, but it is deeply appreciated. I agree, dear Indigo. It is nice to be comfy sometimes, isn't it? By the way, uh, at this, in the Shravana section of our live stream, I'd also love to hear insights from you, especially regarding uh, what we learned from our book. I've also decided to include the show and tell section to the Shravana third of our live stream. So, uh, Generally, I'd like to have a moment to showcase something from you. Maybe a poem, a piece of art, music, a personal project, creative interest of any kind. We've got a couple waiting for us in our coming live streams, but I didn't have time to prepare for one. Just a note for next time. And if you did want to have something to share in the show and tell section, there's a link tree in my bio with an application to drop off images and video files and audio files, PDFs, things like that. So I hope you make use of that. All right. Thank you for exploring this reading session with me, this hearing session, Shravana, let us transition to our Manana section. Mm -hmm. 
This middle third of a sangha is dedicated to reflection, dedicated to interactive exploration of concepts, questions and answers, etc. I would like to begin with a question for all of you. And my question of the day today, I wonder, when is it fair to have rules? And when is it fair to break them? This I would love to know from you. And thank you, dear Kalkiji, for your rose. Om Namo Bhagavate Rudraya. And I'll, uh, I'll do some rapid fire question answers while uh, I wait to hear your answers. Lakonan, you had asked, does the baby penguin have a sound in this live already? It does. I'm uh, stealing uh, Pingu's. Nyot, nyot. Dear Indigo, you asked, did I use AI program to organize and edit the videos on my live stream before I upload it on YouTube? I use a program that I wrote for taking the audio from my videos, transcribing it, then parsing it into chapters for the description, for the title as well, and that includes a chapter system so that one may be able to click on a timestamp of any part of the video. This is done with the use of computational intelligence. Indeed. All right. Dear Anna, you say that rules are made to be broken. <laughs> we have a rule breaker here, dear Anna. Hybrogen, you share, when it's out of our hands. Hmm. I see how that could be applied to the first part of the, the question and the second part. We use rules to help guide that which is out of our control and uh, when we can't be controlled <laughs> we go beyond them dear Mina you said that this question is too hard you don't like rules but you know they can be necessary it's relatable Dear Kalkiji, you share when it's fair, it's fair. <laughs> You're not wrong with that. <laughs> so what does fair mean to you then? We could unbox that. Dear Mina, you share that it's fair to have rules to safeguard people from imminent danger, like traffic signals. That's a great example. I like that. Ryan, you share, if they do not fit with our universal sense of ethics. I like that too. Asad, you share when they ensure safety and justice and can be broken when uh, they are oppressive, yes, or aren't just. Well said. Thank you, dear. Suzarumo. Suzarumo. <laughs> you can tell me how to pronounce your name <laughs> if I can do it better. But many blessings. Mina, you share that it's fair to break them when personal judgment comes in. And in general, you believe there can be a justification to break rules. I see the truth in that. That, that is very helpful, dear Indigo. I would offer my program to, to others, but it, it costs me money to run it, so they would have to have their own uh, API account registered with OpenAI. Dear Jay, you share that rules are self-imposed. A suggestion, but always up to the situation. That is a good observation. Isabella, you share when it goes against humanity and Mother Nature, the grand design. Mother Nature's grand design. I like that. 
Dear Bubbles, you point out that rules only have power if people believe they do. They are constructs of the intellect. Yes. Hmm. Dear Mina. Yes. Sharia law is very sad. It can be. You point out that uh, when you grew up under it, survival and thriving was only possible by breaking rules. So survival and thriving seem to be places where it appears to be more fear. Lacon, and you point out that rules are like politics. Without rules, we can't live together because we all have our own morals. It's very true. Dear Asad, you ask a good philosophical question. Is it okay to break a rule if no one will ever find out? Yet, is it still wrong to do so? Good philosophical questions. I like that. Kalkiji, you have bells like this too? <laughs> Manjura. Alright, thank you Explore, for exploring this question of the day with me. I really like how we covered topics of taking care of Mother Nature, our humanity, our universal sense of ethics when it uh, contradicts what is just, keeping us safe, all of these things are ways of allowing us to possibly go beyond rules when these values are not upheld. It also tells us that these are the values which are ideally to be upheld by the concept of rules. I like how we point out that they are constructs of our intellect, that ultimately they are self-imposed and guidelines, and it's up for our interpretation personally, how we choose to follow them. I think these are great explorations of this concept. Thank you, everyone. When we consider it necessary, shares Anasek. Well said. <laughs> All right, I will pause our question of the day there for now. And now we can really open up our Sangha to explore questions and answers on everything. And Lacon, and you add to that at the tail end of our discussion when breaking rules. It should bring more good to your own ones than bad to others. Yes. All about goodness. Mm -hmm. So I have called this third of the live stream Manana in reference to the Sanskrit word that uh, means reflection, contemplation. It can also be used to describe a kind of healthy and mindful debate where we, we process our experiences. So for the next half hour or so, I, I think we can, we can do so and we'll end the live stream later with Nidhi Dhyasana. Dear Meena, you had asked, what does Sangha mean? Good question. Sangha literally means association. The noun form of the verb to associate. To associate means that we bring our kind of identification to something. If I'm associated with another person, it means that we share some kind of relationship or identity. And when a lot of people come together, you might formally declare an association. Maybe that means a business or an organization. But in the spiritual sense, it refers to a kind of connection that you make with something that ideally is uplifting. Through association, we kind of put out these, uh, how shall you say, um, 
I want to say reachers or grabbers, like little uh, tentacles that extend from our heart and we grab onto something and we pull ourselves towards that concept. If we are constantly contemplating negative things, then we effectively are grabbing and reaching towards negative things and we get pulled down towards that through our association. But satsanga, positive association, means that we're constantly associating with higher and higher truths so that we become elevated and thus serve as role models for others to associate with us. This is the meaning of, of sangha and it's said to be the highest power that consciousness has and everything else in our experience is determined based on that, based on what we associate with. Thank you, dear Isabella, for your finger heart too. Hari Om Tat Sat. Hello, dear angel. Dear Bubbles, you ask, can I speak on the nature of the space between us? That's very beautiful. In some sense, there is no space between us because we are that space that contains our bodies, our minds, and our individual expressions. We share that space. Space can be physical. It can also be emotional. It can be mental. And it can be spiritual. But what is space if not the place in order for expression to arise. The space between us is there for us to express ourselves, to connect, and to be a part of a greater whole. Dear Indigo, you wonder, what are the kinds of mantras I utter during the live stream? They are traditionally Sanskrit, arising from the ancient Indian language. You may find a list of the ones I use in the Frequently Asked Questions page in the link tree in my bio, but uh, you are welcome to ask about any of them in particular. Generally, a mantra has a form of the divine situated in it, and perhaps even something called a bija, which is a seed sound said to be a source for that divinity to grow out of. All of this alludes to a kind of sacred sound through repetition of which we grow, we generate some divine quality. I am curious what everyone's favorite mantras are, if you even have one. I'm not sure if I have a favorite mantra, but I'm a big fan of them. If you do have a favorite mantra, or one that means something to you, I would like to hear what it is for you. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya That's a good one, dear Kalkiji. You had asked, how does one reach the other shore? I assume you are referring to the metaphor of crossing the ocean of Maya, material existence, finding the shore of Satchitananda, truth, consciousness, bliss. I think it's a good metaphor to describe maya, material existence, as an ocean because its surface can be very chaotic. Winds, turbines, tsunamis, great waves. It can, easy to f it can be easy to feel like we're drowning in our material world. However, 
we reach the other shore by realizing that we are already there. That you were not this body and mind, which appeared to be distraught by the circumstance of the world. You are already peaceful deep inside. It's just that like the layers of an onion, we've surrounded ourselves with all of these parts of our identity that truly aren't us, but we've identified with them. An example would be the color of our skin or the clothes that we wear. It's just a layer to our being and our true self is not defined by them. Our true self is independent from the color of the clothes we wear or the color of our skin. What appears to be suffering on the surface is a space for our spirit to bring love into. And thank you, dear Nick, for your rose. Ram, ram. <laughs> Kalki ji, you like the Gayatri Mantra and the Hanuman Chalisa. Those are great mantras. Long ones too. Dear Mina, you share that. Someone released a song today called Mantra. That's fun. I like that. Mm -hmm. Dear Nhoj Alkuk, if I can pronounce your name better, please let me know. You expressed that you wish the radio station in your head would stop switching stations. <laughs> That's very understandable and relatable, my friend. You are very cultured in the genres of music that your mind has to offer. Dear Isabella, you share that your daughter's middle name is Maya. That's very beautiful. Maya gets a, a bad rep in recent times because it has been uh, translated to illusion. <laughs> <laughs> But literally, it refers to the material power of Ishvara, the divine, to generate an experience. The reason that is associated with illusion is because all of our experiences come and go. So you could say if if reality is defined by that which is permanent, then our experiences wouldn't qualify. But by another definition, you could say it's very real. It's just of a different kind of reality. It's just of a, of a changing reality. And it's a power of God. It is the divine feminine herself, this Maya material. It is Mother Universe, isn't she? <gasps> Thank you, Kalkiji, for your pair of roses. Om Sum Suryai Namaha. Dear Bacon the Bird, you learned. Uh, a Shoshane phrase, if I can pronounce that better too, please let me know. And concept on balance, walking in beauty. And you share that I do this? Oh, well, I really have to learn this concept then. <laughs> it's beautiful. Walking in beauty. Well, literally, it's beautiful, but lovely. Aside, you point out that our true self is also different from our shade of emotion at that time. Indeed. It's made difficult to understand that point by our 
language, especially in English, where we grammatically identify with our emotions. We say, I am sad. I am happy. I am depressed. I am anxious. You may be interested to know that that verb to be is not a universal way to express emotion. In other languages, you might say instead, I have sadness, I have happiness, I have depression, I have anxiety. And it wouldn't make sense to say I am any of these things. Because are you the feeling, the sensation, the experience, or are you the experiencer which has them? Just that change in vocabulary can make it more peaceful for you. Because then sadness is no longer something that you are as a limited nature, but just an aspect of a greater experience. And you are the subject, which is different from it all. Om Mani Padme Hung, you like, dear Indigo. That's a beautiful mantra. Good morning, the Arctic self. Kalkiji, you had asked, how does one, through inward meditation, navigate to find the Atman? Where do you go? I like that question, and I'd like to flip this question inside out. Since you are the Atman, you are the true self, the one which is doing the finding, can you ever find it? Logically, the only way for that to be true is for the subject to become the object, for some part of you or self to become separate from yourself so that you can experience it. But the very nature of the Atman is that it cannot be separated. So. In what way do we really mean Atma Vichara, self-inquiry? I would put it like this. Instead of thinking in as contrary to the world, instead of feeling like you have to somehow turn your eyes inside out, your ears inside out, your tongue and your skin inside out, your nose inside out, bleh, Instead of trying to imagine inverting your experience, think about this direction in, in a different way. That it's not in here, but in everything. So you're looking within, not your body or mind exclusively, but in every part of our experience, including that which appears without you go into the soul of the person in front of you, the soul of the plants, the spirit, the space of this experience. You dive into what is before you, and there you find yourself not found as an object of our experience, but the essence of the whole experience. You feel as though Every part of your experience is a reflection of yourself. And how do we practically do that? By changing our behavior. So don't flip inside out. That's right, Isabella. <laughs> I used to think that Engaging in karma yoga, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, all of these engagements happens after realization, that after I realize the truth of myself, then I'll know how to properly engage in my actions, in my devotion, in my studies. But, to me, I found the reverse is true, that you change your behavior to reflect your intellectual realization of truth and then 
from the results of your actions, now you see how that truth becomes practical and the practicality that you discover after basing your actions based on your intellectual realization becomes the nididhyasana, the supplementary realization because you infer that this way of living must be true since you can see it firsthand for yourself if I engage under the assumption that I am the true self in all beings then I must be kind to everyone be patient and compassionate and after deciding to be patient, kind and compassionate we start seeing how true it is to live in that way and you couldn't live any other way therefore you must have discovered a profound truth since your ease of living has become profound Thank you, dear Kalkiji, for another rose. Namaste, dear Chaos Cipher. Biber Zero, thank you for your Heart Me and Team bracelet. Om Gang Ganapatayi Namaha. And dear Anazak, thank you for your Heart Me too. Jai Sita Ram. And Isabella. Thank you for your finger heart. There's one for you as well. Om Namah Shivaya. But what if you need a job, asks Meena. I'm curious. Uh, what, what do you mean exactly? You're welcome to have a job and be spiritual and live according to spiritual truths. Jobs are part of spiritual life because it's one way in which we deliver service to our society, to our world, to Mother Nature, to the people living in it. No job can exist without service. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mina, you're taking this a different route. People think you act crazy and then you don't get hired. Well, you don't have to act crazy. <laughs> Spiritual truths don't make you look crazy. They don't have to, at least. Because uh, living in spiritual truths just means that you're actively listening. You're being attentive to the person speaking because you know it's the same self within them. You nod appreciatively. And you add your own experience without negating theirs. In fact, the more spiritual you become, the more normal you are. That's what Swami Tadapmananda Ji says, the guru of Sky Guardian. That enlightened beings are the most normal people. They're the ones that listen to you with love and no other bias, aren't trying to steer the conversation in any way, are happy to accept you as you are, and will take criticism to heart without getting defensive, you know. <laughs> You become the most uh, genuine human being. If, if, to, if genuineness comes across as craziness, I think we know who the crazy one is then. <laughs> now, I wouldn't recommend calling anyone crazy. That's just, that's just a joke. Everyone is where they are in their path, and so we have to consider that without judgment or labels. Thank you, dear Isabella, for another finger hard to Radhi, Radhi. And Jay, thank you for your rock star. That's very fun. Looks like it looks like Elvis hair. Jay Sachitanandam. Dear Gulai, thank you for your rose as well. Om Kring Kalikai Namaha Chaos Cipher, you wonder if my family supports me in my spiritual journey? You are curious. They are very supportive. Yeah, they just leave me be. That's the nature of, of my parents. They 
They just want me to discover my own happiness. And uh, if I appear to be genuinely happy, then they are happy for me. And it's as simple as that. My parents, uh, just like me, they have their own spiritual journey. And they, fortunately, were not the kind that said, no, you have to be on this journey or that. I hope that um, we can get to a place in our society where that's uh, the default. That everyone is given their independence to explore their own happiness, regardless of, of, of what way you, you express your happiness. Discover the best way to connect with it. And that is a, that is a privilege. Because I know it's, it's not the same for many people. Mm -hmm. Thank you, dear Babble Fishy, for your baby ghost. Om Namo Buddhai. Dear Kaukiji, you share that sometimes you do feel a little bipolar. You can go a little wild. That's when you need Hanuman to calm you down. <laughs> I love that. I love Hanuman. He represents uh, a balance between Bhakti and Shakti. Between loving devotion and the energy to create, sustain, and destroy. And thank you, dear Cassie, for your heart me and trio of pumpkins. Radhi, Radhi. I'm very happy to hear that for you, dear Mina. G2 Infinity, you wonder if I will be able to travel now? Yes. The arrangements that I had uh, were... Um, there was... Uh, you know, very private matters happening with my family and uh, legal systems were involved and I was supposed to stay back until the 10th for a possible court date. Anyway, all is good. Matter has been settled out of court between my uh, my family. Basically, my parents are are separating and, you know, that can be a big legal nightmare for, for, for many, in many ways. But, um, yeah, that, that part has, has been settled. So, fortunately, I am free. I can travel the world without having, having to, be, to be held back for a court appearance. Thank you, dear John F., for your heart, me. Om Namah Shakti Shivaya. Dear Kalki, do you wonder what the what are the benefits to conch shells? Well, if you're in the middle of of a landlocked place and you really want to feel like you're near the ocean, you can just hold one up to your ear and you can hear the ocean. <laughs> I think they are symbolic of um, infinity in. Hindu cosmology because they represent a spiral of, of cycles through various yugas, kalpas, manavantaras, various epochs. Uh, spiral is a kind of cycle because we keep returning to the same angle, but uh, ideally, although this isn't physically possible, it's a, it's a kind of cycle that continues to get subtler and subtler, infinitely so. And you can imagine as you embark zooming in along such a spiral, you will continue to see this unfolding dynamic system we call a spiral. As such, uh, the spiral nature of conch shells, nautilus shells, other shells are, are revered in Hinduism as a form of Vishnu, primarily as the all-pervader 
uh, the ruler of time and the cycles of cosmology and the evolution of consciousness. As far as the benefits for having one, I suppose the more you bring your awareness to such symbolism, the more you begin to appreciate those aspects of our existence. Dear Lana Banana, sounds like you are going through a intense weather pattern and you are without power in Milton. Can we send you peaceful vibes, of course? Know that uh, this experience shall pass and um, I trust that regardless of what happens, you will be able to say that this is something that you've gone through, you've learned through, and it will not break you down, but rather provide you with a deep experience to be able to empathize with so many people around you during this vulnerable time. Om Shanti 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 That's the peace mantra, meaning Om Peace, Peace, Peace. Thank you, dear hybrid Jen, for the cheer you up you had sent. Radhe, Radhe. And John F., thank you for your friendship necklace, finger heart, and a tiny diny. Yippee! Thank you, Gulai, for another rose. And Anazak, thank you for your tiny diny. Yahoo! Hanuman is the best. Yes. Bubbles, you ask, if you subscribe, how many desire systems can you expect gone within the first month? <laughs> as many as you are committed to working through with me. And the same is true if you subscribe or not. <laughs> My commitment to you is not dependent on what you provide for me. Dear Cody Jane, you share that you hear an odd static with the microphone. I don't know why I'm listening to the microphone as if it's the one generating the static. <laughs> that is probably to do with the noise suppression and compression. It is a... Uh, it is a fact of, of uh, audio engineering that if you use noise suppression and compression at the same time, then when you stop speaking for a moment, you will often hear an elevated background noise before it lowers. It is almost unavoidable if you're dealing with these kinds of audio filters. That's a fun fact for you. Dear Cassie, you share that you always added Hanumanasana in your splits while teaching the Hanuman rocks. While teaching because Hanuman rocks. I was going to say, I was wondering what the Hanuman rocks are. I would love to have a Hanuman rock, whatever it is. Hanumanasana, I'd like to know what that is. I hope it's like a monkey pose of some sort. <laughs> Thank you, dear Bubbles, for your subscription. I'm very grateful to have you here, and we can work through those desire systems together. But all the work, all the effort must be applied by you, of course. I am here to, uh, for you to, to give your troubles to, your pains, your worries. I'll take them off your hands. You don't have to have them. And that goes for anyone. If there's something that's weighing on your heart, you can offer it to me. I would much rather that than any rose or heart me or subscription. Give me your, your sadness. I'll take it. 
If you're not going to use it, you know. <laughs> what a what a religiously diverse upbringing, dear Indigo. I love that. <laughs> dear Isabella, 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 you share that you're glad that your eyes are open and your heart is willing to accept all spirituality openly. What a role model you are to all of us. Thank you. Thank you for your finger heart too. Om Namah Shakti Shivai. And I like that, Nahoj, what you said about the mushrooms being a short-lived manifestation of infinite possibility. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Welcome, dear Marlin. I'm sorry to hear about the experience you had with, with your parents' separation. Vic Staru on the topic of conch shells. I'm a little behind reading the comments you had shared that your stepmom used to tell you that if you listen, you can hear mermaids. I love that. She must be right. And thank you, Kalkiji, for your pair of roses. Ram, ram. Much love, Wes. Oh, these beautiful souls take care of their, themselves. I just become witness to their beauty. Mina, you ask if my interest in maths led me to spirituality. For me, it did. Yes. I talk about that in the link tree in my bio on the Frequently Asked Questions page, but as a short summary, the reason I went into math is because it was the language of physics. And to me, physics had the capacity of explaining all phenomenon, from the quantum to the cosmic. But I realized that it was math that gave that ability to physics, if you know what I mean. That the math itself had the power to encode a universe such as ours, or even a completely different one. So there was more creative potential that I was after in mathematics itself. I could explore the root cause of infinite universes through math. But then I asked a similar question about what gave math the power to generate infinite theoretical universes. And that led me to logic. What about logic gave it the power to describe all possible mathematical systems, etc.? And if I keep asking that question, what gives the power to that? What is its source? I think naturally you will find the source. <laughs> Dear Mika, hello. You had shared that you feel that God is looking down on you. You've had multiple people come back in your life this week. Oh, I'm happy. I'm happy your, your sentence went that way. I thought in the first half that looking down meant disappointed, which would never be true for the divine. But how wonderful that you feel that there is a, a presence watching over you and that you've experienced so much wonder in your life again. Possibilities open up. I'm happy to hear that for you. Galkiji had asked if I had some information on Dream of the Endless Morpheus the Sandman. That sounds beautiful. Morpheus is a beautiful word. Um, no, I can't say I do. I would love to learn more about that with you, though. Dream is a very important part of our life. Hello, don't worry about it. Cassie, you shared that Hanumanasana is a half-split pose as a nod to his story. Oh, how interesting. With one foot all the way in Lanka, wasn't it? And another foot all the way in wherever in India. Oh, I like that. I'll have to learn it. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I, I lost the context to which Angela asks if I'm sure. 
probably the answer is no. <laughs> I'm sure about nothing. <laughs> I'm just very confident that uh, if I'm wrong, I will be able to reconcile that and learn. Therefore, I, I fear not. Thank you, don't worry about it, for the rose that you had sent. Ram, Ram. Hanumanasana is full split, so... Thank you for updating, dear Cassie. Gulai, thank you for your rose. Om Namah Shakti Shivai. And Dob Darker, thank you for your heart, me too. Om Gring Kalikai Namaha. You've got a great memory, dear Mina. Hello, dear Benny. Another Ben, Benjable. You had asked if I had any thoughts on how to be more focused and less rigid. Hmm. I like that you associate focus with flexibility because we might stereotype focus as a kind of rigid one-pointed identification with the subject whereas a high kind of focus is very dynamic very fluid where you flow from one subject to another finding the connection going from one effortlessly frictionlessly Friction means that there's some resistance. That two things are coming in contact with each other. And they're rubbing up on each other, grinding away at each other. And eventually, like sandpaper, one of those things will be ground down. You can ask yourself, of that with which you wish to attain focus, what part of you is in resistance to that? We can ask ourselves, do I feel like if I give my attention to this, that part of me will feel like I should be giving attention elsewhere? And because that part is very vocal, it's pulling at my conscious awareness away from what I want to be focused on. Benchable, you share, it feels like a paradox. Like focus requires a certain level of ease that you struggle with. Yes. Perhaps I can add that when we think of focus, in our culture we might think of focus on the goal but that would be very result oriented and the easiest way to stress yourself out is to be result oriented i was reading a resume the other day i don't know i don't know it's funny how it came up but i was just looking at this person's resume and i noticed that they had written in their list of of, um, you know, good traits, result-oriented. And of course, it makes sense. A business would want that. But when it comes to our happiness, that's the last thing we want. Because as long as we are focused on what isn't, how can we be happy with what is now? And what is now is not a result, but a process. So let your focus be on what is achievable just right now, the very next accessible step. Worry not about what the ultimate goal is, whether you'll realize it in this lifetime or not. Let yourself be validated by the blessing it is to engage in just the next step of the journey. Shifting our focus from the result to the process, I think, makes it less stressful 
and more relaxing. I think that's where the ease comes in. Let me know if that resonates with you. Thank you, dear Angela, for your ice cream cone. Om Brahm Hanumate Namaha. It does. You're very welcome. I'm still learning that myself. And um, learning that is part of the very process, isn't it? It's very easy to become entangled in an ironic way with such a truth, such a spiritual truth. We can go, okay, I should be process-oriented rather than result-oriented. But then, being process-oriented becomes the result which we're trying to attain. Thus, we become result-oriented about trying to become process-oriented. So in a meta way, we have to add, even that is part of the process. Learning to become process-oriented. Which simply means every time we catch ourselves being result-oriented, no need to worry then. That's part of the process too. And we, without judgment, calmly guide our awareness back to the process. Thank you, dear Cassie, for your trio of pumpkins. Jaya Shiva Brahma Vishnu And Isabella, thank you for your trio of roses too. Om Kringalikaye Namaha Dear Kalki Ji, you ask, How do I make the environment around me so high in general and things become trippy? Mudras and Samadhi you're wondering, what you're asking is, how can you cultivate an aura that bends space and time? Yes. I remember uh, a few weeks ago, you were asking about how to cultivate so much prana that you could wield the, what was it, the Sudarshana Chakra. <laughs> so much prana that you could change the very yuga which we are in. Mm-hmm. Well, like a, like a mother, I'm a little cautious about wanting to gain so much power. You know, we can work with what we've got and find, uh, and find joy in the small and mundane. <laughs> but I like your question. And I would recommend, as I said before, continued practice of brahmacharya. Ideally, the goal is to cultivate ojas. Now, this is far from scientific truth, but I'll just tell you what the scriptures say. That uh, the food we eat, it becomes, what is it? I think it's called kaim. And that's scientifically true. The chyme then becomes uh, fat tissue. The fat tissue becomes muscle tissue. The muscle tissue becomes bone tissue. The bone tissue becomes marrow. The marrow becomes blood. And so far, it's, that's all pretty scientifically accurate, although there's a lot of nuance there. But we're talking about scripture anyway. I think it's amazing that thousands of years ago they understood that much at least. But then it said that the blood becomes the sexual fluids, which are different depending on the bodies you have. And for most people, that's what the process of energy transmutation stops. That through a long period of time, the energy that you put in calorically eventually becomes sexual fluid. That's the highest it goes, it's the most refined, and it's very powerful. The substance, we can create life with it. But it's said that that sexual fluid has another stage of evolution. That if we keep it in our body, 
And this doesn't just refer physically, but also refers to a kind of, of, of mental solidarity to refrain from sexual thoughts, too. Sexual uh, behaviors in our culture, too. And by the way, this is not for everyone. For most people, this practice is not recommended. But if you're, if you're like Kalkiji and you want to really increase your spiritual energy and see what is fully possible with the human body, then we retain that very sublime form of energy and then turn that into something we call ojas. And it is said to travel up the spine as cerebral spinal fluid and enter the brain and unlock that other percentage points of our nervous system that aren't being used for conscious engagement of creation, sustenance, and dissolution in our universe. Whether you want to believe that or not is, of course, subjective, but I assume that Kalkiji would be interested in hearing that, so you're welcome to consider that. For everyone else, I recommend not to be so hard on yourself with the idea of, of restraining oneself sexually because there's a lot of sexual trauma in our society, both coming from spiritual and, uh, and religious sources. And so um, if you feel like you are exploring your sexuality mindfully, consensually with yourself and everyone involved, then no problem, that can be a spiritual experience too. Thank you, dear Dev, for your rose as well. Aryom Tadsat. Anazek, thank you for your 11 roses. Om Namah Shakti Shivaya. But in general, the practice of delaying sensual gratification can be very good for cultivating certain abilities. Um, anyone who's tried No Not November, you may know that uh, at the end of the month, it's like your cognitive faculties are just at 100%. You can recall almost everything that was said in the conversation. You wake up with so much more energy and that you are ready to just take on the day. A great, uh, a great spiritual leader named Swami Vivekananda he would often refer back to points that were discussed years ago in conversation that were only brought up once. Parts of people's lives that even they did not remember. And so naturally the question arose, how, how do you have such a good memory? You know, is it, have you always had this? And he said, no. It wasn't until I took sannyas, renunciation, and I engaged in brahmacharya, the way of the ultimate, restraining the vital fluid, that my memory became so sharp that now I can just read something once and relay it to you ten years from now. It's also said that uh, when you cultivate ojas, your power of speech just becomes so much more impactful that you don't even have to really speak the right word. You can just speak gibberish and the people listening to you just go, wow, you know? <laughs> you feel like you've learned so much even if they say very little. Swami Vivekananda didn't know much English and his guru instructed him to go to America to deliver a talk at this uh, peace summit of, of different religious leaders and he didn't know what to say but his guru assured him that it would be okay and so he just walked up to the podium and the first thing that came out of his mouth was hello brothers and sisters and it said that there was so much power in just those four words that uh 
everyone stood up and just clapped. Because to just have the presence of such a, a powerful spiritual being there, to walk up and even say those words was, you know, it sent shivers down their spine. They knew they were ready for an incredible discourse. Anyway, it's literally one of those stories where everyone claps. So who knows the validity of that? It happened in the, uh, the early 20th century. Thank you, dear Kalkiji, for your roses. Om Namo Kalkiji. Actually, it wouldn't be a Namo, it would be Namach, with that rare Jiva Mulia sound, the guttural ch. Om Namach Kalikaji. No, wait, that's Kali. Om Namach Kalkiji. Thank you, dear auntie, for your heart me. Om Kring Kalikai Namaha. It is malt again. You ask, does it apply to all genders? Uh, yeah. Of course, it's very different because men are constantly generating sperm, whereas women are born with uh, all of their eggs. So... A different kind of energy is used. Energy for, for someone who can produce sperm is going to be used differently than someone who already has their eggs produced. I guess the equivalent would be the energy that's used during the menstrual cycle has a big part of it. I'm not exactly sure what the the relationship would be because obviously we can we can prevent ourselves from releasing sperm but uh, uh, releasing the the lining of our uterine walls is not exactly something that can be controlled but uh, apparently some amount of, of that energy can be retained we can live in a certain way have a certain sadhana it said that uh, reduces the flow so that you don't have as much heavy flow. And some women have even been able through their yogic, um, their yoga maya, which is a beautiful term. You've heard of yoga. You might have heard of maya, which refers to the ability to create the universe. Yoga maya refers to the power that is generated through yoga. It said that some yoginis through their yoga maya were even able to stop their periods. And how nice would that be? <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if you could say, Huzzah! This month, no more. Naturally, that happens with old age anyway, though. You'll notice that many, uh, many spiritual themes that are cultivated in yoga happen naturally over time too like naturally as we age we, we our sexual desire becomes less and less so the yogic practice is really about um, advancing into those stages not getting older physically but getting more mature spiritually earlier Anyway, I am not a, uh, a qualified teacher to tell you how to do that, nor am I a medical professional. So all of this is just my second-hand account based on what I have learned from other people's experiences. Thank you, dear auntie, for your heart. Me, did I thank you for that? I will thank you again. Ariyum Tadsat. But uh, generally, what is achievable in a male or female body or anything else along that spectrum is possible regardless of where you are. If our true self, Atma, is, is beyond quality, that means it's beyond gender too. So these scriptures inform us that when it comes to our spiritual reality. There is no limitation at the level of body. 
so fret not. But we do have to consider the differences in our bodies, in our biology. Goodbye, dear Anna Zek. Happy that you could make the live stream today. Dear Asad, you wonder what my thoughts are of you during this short time of knowing. Well, if you're wondering if I've made a judgment of you, I have not. And that's not due to the timeline upon which I've known you. I just leave that forever open. Tomorrow you could show up as a completely different person and I'll have to accommodate that. I'm not going to hold against you expectations that come based off of uh, the impressions you've made on me so far. I'm inspired by a story of the Buddha, where someone came to him and was scolding him, saying all these negativities, cursing out the Buddha, the Sangha, the Dharma. And then when he had enough, he left. During that time, this man thought about that interaction. You know how after an argument, you're thinking about what you could have said differently or a better comeback you could have said. You're in the shower and you're, you're having that argument. You're being both people. And you're thinking, oh, I should have just said that. That would have been way cooler. I could have stopped the argument there. I could have walked away and put my sunglasses on and have an explosion in the distance. And then you think about it. Oh, actually, they, they could have brought up that point too. Oh, I'm glad I didn't say that then. You continue like that. Happens all the time, Angela. Yeah, so this guy did that too. Ancient humans are the same as modern humans. <laughs> but he realized that when he was thinking back on the argument, it was entirely one-sided. That the Buddha didn't argue at all. In fact, he didn't say anything. Neither did anyone around him there was such respect and reverence for the Buddha that even the Sankhis knew that they didn't need to get involved. They just held space. And when the guy had enough, he walked away. And that devastated him. That man thought, oh my God, I just came in there, yelled and cursed at these people, and they didn't say anything back to me. And that started creating a, a hole in his heart. So he came back the next day and he walked up and uh, he said, I'm sorry, can you please forgive me? And the Buddha said, no. Another plot twist in this story. The Buddha said, no. <gasps> now the Sangha was shocked. All the bhikkhus, the Buddhist monks, the Buddha, who is the Lord of compassion and forgiveness, said no. The man was also shocked. He said, why not? The Buddha said, I cannot forgive that person that came and yelled at me because that person isn't here today. If you find that person again, you can tell them I forgive them, but as far as I'm concerned, there is someone totally new before me today. That story is very touching, and uh, I'm very grateful that it's such a practical story too, because I know it would be unfair of me also in this space to judge anyone based on how they react at one time. So I say that I have little thoughts of you, not because I don't think of you, <laughs> but so that you know that there's never an expectation. Because if I said I like how you're this way and that, then you're thinking, 
well, that is how I am to be perceived in this space next time. And if I don't either transcend the limitations or reach the threshold of, of perception as I was before, then I will suffer. Dear Kalkiji, you ask, who would win in a fight of the cosmos, Buddha or Shiva or Hanuman? <laughs> who would win in a fight? This is assuming they would fight. <laughs> Great beings. They have no quarrel with anyone. They have no fight because they are one with everyone. For the Buddha to to fight Shiva or Hanuman or or vice versa, they would only be hurting themselves. And what kind of role model would they have for others? That forms of the divine or spiritual incarnations should be compared, and that we should only choose the one that can beat the other one up. No, I think. The Buddha, Shiva, and Hanuman, they would be best friends. Actually, Shiva is Hanuman, because Hanuman is an incarnation of, of Shiva. And Shiva is a devotee of Buddha, because in Hinduism, Buddha is considered an avatar of Vishnu, the one before um, Kalki, and after Krishna. And so, Shiva would be a devotee of Buddha. <laughs> And they're all representing the same oneness. Thank you, dear Lulu, for your rose that you sent. Om Namah Shakti Shivaya. I like what the Buddha spoke of violence, that it only leads to more violence. It's very simple, but I think we all can see the truth of that in our experience. Thank you, dear Galakiji, for your rose as well. Ram, Ram. Now, Sol Invictus, you wonder what my favorite kind of food is. My favorite kind of food is that which is flavorful, nutritious, and leads to a clear mind. Goodbye, dear Mina. Thank you for being there. Hannah, you ask, what is a day in the life for me? Well, today I, I slept in very late. I think I got out of bed at 5 p.m. <laughs> I could really wake up earlier. <laughs> See, what happened is um, I took a week off of streaming and I spent almost every day in the elements without my phone, without a wallet, no one to contact me and I came home after that week with with very blistered feet and so I didn't take very good care of them and they kept me up last night on top of that my dear cat Sandy wanted to sleep in the middle of the bed and he wouldn't let me move because for some reason, he thinks that it's an animal underneath the bed sheets. Every time I try to move, he bounces on me, bites my feet. <laughs> so it took a while before I actually got to sleep last night. And then when I finally did, I slept all the way through the morning and afternoon. <laughs> I hope to get uh, 
I hope to go to sleep earlier tonight. And because of that, I will beginning. I will be ending our live stream shortly. Just to let you know. Mm -hmm. Just going to get to the end of of our manana, our reflection, and we'll close with nididhasana, which is uh, meditation. I mean, if you like the whiteboard, your salve. And if there's a symbol of a, of a tradition that you would like to be included, I'll happily try to find room for it. Angela, you ask, how tall am I? I know exactly how tall I am because it's a funny number in inches. The last time I measured, although I think I am growing, actually. It was 69. Nice. Which is five nine. You like the heart traditions, ah, good observation, dear Christy Joe. It's all love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right, Marcy. I'm gonna be sleeping sixteen hours a day by December. <laughs> I'm just like a cat, you know, they sleep 18 hours a night. I get my dreams and I do a lot of work at the, at the dream level. <laughs> You're headed to bed too, dear angel. Well, let's, let's begin to wrap up then. Thank you, dear Jeffrey, for your heart me rose and 10 tiny dinies. Have you share the mother cross would be a cute addition. You don't know if I know. I don't know. Basically a cross with a circle at the top wrapping around. I will look it up afterwards and add it. Thank you. Ryan, you ask if I'm vegan. I am not vegan because I still eat dairy products. Lacto-vegetarian, I guess you'd call it. Um... That's what I found works best for me, what works best for you. And I encourage you to deepen body-mind connection. Dear Candle, thank you for your heart me. Radhe, Radhe. And Vivian, thank you for your paper crane. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Marcy wants me to, to wear the hood to be like Baby Yoda. Does Baby Yoda have a hood? I can't remember. Yeah. I could be um, a Jawa from Star Wars. Thank you, dear Angela, for your rose still. Radhe, Radhe. And... Thank you for your horror candles, dear deeply. Ms. Bliz, you share that vegetarians eat chicken, turkey, fish, and dairy. I think you are thinking of, of pescatarians that eat fish. There's also ovo, ovo vegetarians, which eat eggs. And uh, I forget the term for those that eat birds, but no, vegetarians do not eat chicken, turkey, fish, but they may eat dairy if they're a lacto-vegetarian. Thank you, dear Jeffrey, for your hat and mustache. Om Namah Shakti Shivaya. <laughs> and thank you for your rose. Radhe, Radhe. Ms. Bliss, thank you for your heart me as well. Om Kamalir Maha Kalikaye Namaha. And Angel, thank you for your subscription here too. I'm grateful for your presence here and I hope you have a good night tonight and I look forward to crossing paths with you next time. Kalkiji. Thank you for your pair of roses. 
Om Varra Om Hanumate Namaha. And Anazak, thank you for your half a dozen roses. Om Brahm Bhairvai Namo Namaha. Dear Jeffrey, thank you for your little crown. Hari Om Tatsat. And Ange, thank you for your perfume. Jayasat Chittanandam. And Avant Garde, thank you for your fortnight's worth of roses. One for each day in a fortnight. Mani Padme Hum And Gabriella, thank you for your heart me. Radhi Radhi After the dream server shares indigo. Yes, I like that. <laughs> thank you, dear Jeffrey. It's very interesting, dear Miss Bliss. Normally, what you describe as someone who eats vegetables and other stuff is an omnivore. Um, but yeah, I, unless I'm in a new timeline, a Mandela effect, perhaps someone could tell me if I'm wrong. Vegetarianism usually refers to the absence of, of animal products with the exception of dairy products, sometimes, depending on what kind of vegetarian you are, or uh, egg, pro egg products too. Whereas veganism does indeed refer to no, no animal products. But um, either way, you will generally find that in spiritual places. It's encouraged to eat more, more food that grows from the ground, Simple food, fruits, nuts, vegetables, very good for the mind. Mm -hmm. All right. I would like to transition to our final segment of our live stream. Today was a little longer manana section. This is the final third of our Sangha, or probably much shorter than a, than a third, but this is dedicated to Nididhyasana. We have concluded our uh, questions and answers, and I just realized that the banner that's floating below it is incorrect, and I need to fix that next time. Nididhyasana is for a kind of resolution for everything that we've learned so far from our reading that we did at the beginning in our Shravana section, all the insights that were shared so far, our answers to the question of the day, and our conceptual exploration that we've had in our Manana section. Let's end our live stream with a conclusion. We've had a nice journey so far. Let us reflect back on the journey and bring ourselves to rest and consider some of the practical things we can do as we depart off this live stream for sleep if it's nighttime for you or for work wherever you're headed after this we can think about what kind of things to keep in mind to make every part of our day uh, happy peaceful one which is inclusive Thank you for joining me with this final section of our Sangha. Let us reflect on uh, a meditation tonight. This will be how we conclude. Today I would like to do a guided contemplation on limitations and freedom. So, if you'd like to participate, all I ask is that uh, you absorb yourself in this thought stream.
you may consider this a kind of guided meditation. So feel free to get comfortable in a position or movement that allows you to listen. If that means lotus position, back straight, hands and mudra is great. If it means lying on your sides, if it means standing, no problem. If it means bouncing your leg, if it means fidgeting with something, that's okay too. Ultimately, the position of meditation is not important as is the ability to absorb yourself in the subject. Whatever movement or stillness you find allows you to do that with ease, be affirmed in that. Tonight I'd like to walk through the concept of limitations and what was the other thing? Freedom, that's right. I had to open my eyes to read that. <laughs> we'll just begin with three conscious breaths at your own natural rhythm and speed. It is no doubt that this world is full of limitations. Our body can only do so much before it gets tired. Our muscles can only exert themselves so much as to lift that much weight. Our bones are only as strong as they are healthy. We are only as flexible as we practice our stretches. We are limited by space and time. We are limited by our culture by our upbringing. We are limited by the laws of physics. Our mind has limitations based on our state of trauma and healing, based on our education, our vocabulary. We are limited by our motivations. There are limitations based on our government, limitations dependent on our genetics. And in spite of all these limitations, we all strive for a kind of freedom from them. We want to be free from the judgment of our past, which we could not control. We want to be free from the thoughts in our mind, which can appear at times to be intrusive. We wish to be free from our traumas, free from exclusion based on our gender, our age, our nationality, our religion. In spite of all these limitations, we aspire for freedom. And if that's true for you, maybe think about one thing in your life that you do feel limited by. Maybe that's in a relationship an occupation, a belief system. I encourage you to bring to mind just one thing, 
one limitation that you would like to be free from. Think about how your life has been impacted by that limitation. Think about the ways in which you've had to adapt according to that limitation. And consider how, above all, you know that you shouldn't be defined by it. That your true self, whatever that is, is not something that can be limited. Recognize that limitations are part of a physical world. But you are not physical. Notice that all of the limitations that one can think of merely arise according to our perceptions of it. Our perception of sight, sound, taste, smell, feeling, our perception of thought, all these limitations occur to us rather than as us. That we are something already beyond those limitations. Just not all at once. You can visualize a vast ocean which by itself is formless a notion that expands in all directions. This ocean is the source of waves, is the source of ripples, is the source of tidal movement. It is the substrate of ice, icebergs, of steam, with this one vast ocean, many forms, many dances can be experienced. Yet any form that ocean expresses itself through will have a limitation. One wave is only going to stand so tall relative to another. Only if we are comparing the heights of waves does one appear as small or big. If we are pointing out the number of waves, only then we consider dividing one patch of the ocean from another, with one wave beginning and another ending. Consider the boundary that divides an iceberg from its ocean even though it's of the same essence. We see that an iceberg is here and over there it is not. Every form that this ocean takes appears to have a boundary to it, defining where one expression starts and another stops. In the drops of rain that fall, or that make up the mist and the clouds, there appears to be a region around it where it is not. The point of this visualization is to change our perception of what a limitation really means not as something that restricts the essence of something, but as an inevitability of taking form. So let us look at all the waves in the ocean, the icebergs, the drops of water, not according to limitations of the ocean, but as unique expressions 
and since they share the same space to express themselves through, naturally it will appear as though one is bigger, one is smaller, one is over here and one is not. And as I pause the alarm on my phone, which is vibrating, consider the boundary of your own self. Thank you. That you have a region in which you feel that you are existing and outside you are not. That this is your identity and that is not. But just like an iceberg, a wave or a drop of water. That is not because you are limited by essence. For you are the ocean. All of these things are just boundaries of the expression together along with other expressions of the very same waters. In this universe too, nothing is limited, only shares boundaries which when considered a part of one whole are together as a great universe in shared identity. So consider your limitation, whatever it was that you brought to mind, as just one particular expression of this universe, a boundary between one form and another, or as your true self is formless and contains even that which you feel limited by. And know, like all things in the ocean, this too shall change. Boundaries dissolve as icebergs melt into waters or freeze to become larger or break apart or fuse into one. Raindrops fall to the ocean. Waves collapse and crash through each other. All of these boundaries which we feel divided by are subject to change, but our essence as one, as whole, always and forever. You are free in your formless nature. This universe is free in its infinite expressions. Your freedom is gained not when all boundaries are dissolved and limitations destroyed, but in recognizing that they never were restricting you at all. And we can take three more breaths. And if your eyes are closed, you can rub your eyes, open them up. Thank you for listening. Namaste. So, we have reached the, the end of our Sangha today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to those who sent a gift while we were reading, or while I was I'm so used to uh, reading at the end of these sanghas for our meditation. Let's see. Thank you, dear Starlight Wow, for the tiny tiny you had sent before. Yippee! Dupini, thank you for your heart, me. Arion Tatsat and Shaina. Thank you for your trio of roses. Dum dum da.
dihargai nama ha inevitable thank you for your trio of roses also radhi or radhi and angela thank you for your rose om namah shivaya avant garde thank you for your rose om kring kalikai namaha and isabella thank you for your finger heart ram ram dear g2 infinity you like the pink hearts on the first version whiteboard well i can certainly add some more hearts for you next time for those who um are used to the structure of our live streams that we've been doing for almost a year now i've decided to switch things up just a little bit and structure it according to the sanghas of gyana yoga that would have been traditionally done where the first third is dedicated to shravana listening it's where uh, our attention is on someone sharing something like the author of our book or the show and tells of you and then the second third the middle third is dedicated to manana contemplation processing our experiences questions and answers and then our final third is dedicated to landing the plane nididhyasana meditation so rather than introducing anything new we allow ourselves to find a kind of resolution in the journey we've shared in our whole sangha thus far so i leave you to think about how you want to spend the rest of your day or night what kind of moment you wish to have what emotions allow yourself to lock in any knowledge that you may have gained from each other sharing beautiful things together thank you for the space that we share this wouldn't be possible without you and thank you natasha for the rose that you sent arion tatsa without further ado i wish you all well know that you are affirmed in all that you are and all that you do we make mistakes every day as humans and if you're holding on to a perfect version of yourself that doesn't make mistakes well we have to recognize that we are human and mistakes are part of the process don't beat yourself up so much about what you could or could not have done allow yourself to learn the lesson and make change in this moment recognize that the process is more important than the result make peace with what you have and let us continue to shape a better tomorrow thank you dear g2 infinity This recording, this whole live stream will be posted on my Yam Socks Lives YouTube channel if ever any part of it uh, is important for you. Now that we have kind of structured this live stream, if you can't make the beginnings or ends, you're welcome to go check out the recordings. And in the chapters, there is uh in the description, there's time stamps down to everything that we do, not just the the shravana manana nididhasana, but also each topic that we cover so please make use of that if you wish also the readings the meditations they have their own playlists there too so check that out in the uh, link tree in my bio you can find a link to that and many other things that we do may this live stream be an offering to the divinity within you I recognize that uh, everyone here is an expression of perfect truth. There's nothing I can add to your perfection when it comes to your spirituality, your spirit. This is a 
place for us to, well, provide space for each other's expression to thrive. And I am honored to be a witness to the beauty that naturally unfolds and all the humility, all of the love, patience, compassion. And I am honored to be a witness to the beauty that naturally unfolds and all the humility, all of the love, patience, compassion. Maybe it's for a good reason that my internet is connected. Please let me know if my connection returned. I hope to be able to speak to you and not just to the void. <laughs> it has returned. Oh, good. Um... How poetic, dear Magdalene, that that repeated for you. I think we have one of the most caring and compassionate audiences. This is just my guess. I don't view many TikTok live streams myself, but I, I gather from people that join here and say that this is an oddly peaceful place to find on TikTok, that we're making miracles happen just by having such a peaceful place and such a chaotic uh, a chaotic platform <laughs> so that makes me happy to hear that is truly uh, a miracle all right ending mantra um asatoma sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Murtyorma Amritang Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om, lead us from the real to that which is more real because I messed up that which is unreal to the real Asatoma Satkamaya. From darkness to light, from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Thank you all for uh, being here. Thank you for my lovely moderators for, for peacekeeping too. May you all have a wonderful rest of your present moment. And thank you, Sarah Lynn, for the harp me. Hariom Tatsat and dear Anna, thank you for your GG. Jaya Sajitanandam. <laughs>